this is episode 34 of this true crime podcast. This is the case of serial killer Stephen Port, often called the so-called Grinder killer, due to the fact that he met a lot of his male victims on dating apps and dating sites. He was known to have killed at least four young men and he also drugged and raped many others. Stephen Port was born on the 22nd of February of 1975 in Southend-on-Sea, which is in Essex, which is in south-east of England. The family moved to Dagenham in London when Stephen was very young. Dagenham is in East London. Stephen Port has been described by those that knew him whilst he was growing up as being a little peculiar. And many people described him as seemingly almost childlike. Even when he became an adult, it is known that he liked to play with children's toys for some reason. Stephen came out to those that knew him as a gay man when he was in his mid-twenties. After leaving school, he enrolled at an art college, but for some reason he dropped out after only a very short time. At the time of the murders, he was living alone in a flat in Barking, which is in London. He was working as a chef at the local stagecoach bus depot in West Ham, which was close by to where he lived. Stephen Port even appeared on an episode of the very popular cooking programme Master Chef, but I think it was only for just one episode. Stephen Port made a lot of effort to try and keep in shape. He regularly attended a local gym to work out. He was considered by many people who knew him to be quite athletic. It is known that he often used dating sites and dating apps to meet young men. The men were usually a lot younger than himself. It came out later that he also liked to use the so-called date rape drug GBH on some of the men that he met and it is thought that it was largely without their prior knowledge, let alone consent, that he used the drug on them. Once the drug took hold, he would allegedly rape his male victims. He would eventually move on to actual murder. His first known murder victim was a young man called Anthony Walgate. Anthony was only 23 years old and quite naive, really, when he met up with Stephen Port. Anthony was a fashion student and he lived in London, but he was originally from Hull, which is in the north of England. It has been reported that to earn some extra money, sometimes Anthony would work as a male escort, although this was never really proven, so maybe it was just gossip. It is thought that this is how he met Stephen Port, however. Stephen is said to have offered him some money to spend some time with him. The men had supposedly arranged to meet at Barking Railway Station in London on the 17th of June of 2014. A call was made to the emergency services on the 19th of June 2014 to report a man who the caller said was in a bad way. The caller said that it appeared that the man was having some sort of medical emergency, either a seizure or a drugs overdose. The call had come in to the police at 8 o'clock in the morning. Surprisingly, the actual caller was Stephen Port himself, but he did not give his real name to the emergency services. He instead told them that he had just arrived home from a night shift and had come across a young man who was unknown to him, but that he appeared to be in a bad way, and the man was just outside the entrance to the flats that the caller lived in. The police would later trace the call back to Stephen Port, and despite probably finding it a bit suspicious that he had used a false name when reporting finding the man, Stephen Port was not linked to Anthony's death at this time. Stephen Port was charged in connection with this case. He was charged with perverting the course of justice. The case went to trial in March of 2015. Stephen Port was found guilty and subsequently sentenced to eight months in prison, but he only actually ended up serving a couple of months for this 
crime of perverting the course of justice. He was, however, required to wear an ele electronic tag when he was eventually released. Anthony had been discovered after the emergency services had been notified, but he was unfortunately already dead. Anthony's death was not treated as a suspicious death and it was put down as a possible drugs overdose. This obviously meant that the police were not really going to spend too much time investigating Anthony's death. It would later come to light that in between Stephen Port being charged with the crime of perverting the course of justice and his actual trial which took place just a few months later he went on to kill another two men during that time before he served his few months in jail. As is quite typical, a lot, a lot of information would not come out until later when Stephen Port was finally apprehended for the murders. Stephen Port's second known murder victim was a young man called Gabriel Govari. Gabriel Gabriel was in his 20s at the time of his death. He was originally from Slovakia. Gabriel Kavari was known to Stephen Port because, according to a friend of Gabriel's, he had shared a flat with Stephen. They were not thought to have both been in a relationship, just that they had shared a flat, but very for a very short period of time. Gabriel was known to be gay and it is said that he would often use dating apps or dating sites to meet other young men in London. Gabriel's body was discovered in a graveyard by a woman out walking her dog in August of 2014. The woman had noticed a man propped up against a wall in the graveyard which she would often walk through with her dog early in the mornings. She thought at first that he was just asleep or drunk, but soon realised that he was in fact dead. She called the police who came out to the churchyard at St Margaret's Church in Barking in London. Once again, though, the police put the young man's death down to a drugs overdose and did not appear to look into any other possibilities at that time. There were traces of the date rape drug GBH in his system, however, but still the police seemed to have already made their minds up, just like they had done previously with Anthony Walgate's death just a few months earlier and only a short distance from where Gabriel Cavari's body had just been found. The dog walker raised concerns with the police and later said that she had suspected foul play in relation to the young man's death. Unbelievably, the same woman and the dog would soon come across another body in almost the exact same place as the first body had been discovered. About one week after Stephen Port had murdered and dumped Gabriel's body, he was already making plans to find another young male victim. He was visiting dating apps and sites and he made contact with a young man called Daniel Whitworth, who was only 21 years old at the time. Daniel lived in Gravesend, which is in Kent, which is in the southeast of England and pretty close to London. Stephen Port and Daniel Whitworth made arrangements to meet up. Unfortunately, the same fate befell Daniel as it had Gabriel and also Stephen's first victim, Anthony. He was drugged with GBH, raped and murdered and, unbelievably, his body was dumped in the same spot as Gabriel's had been just a short time earlier. And as I mentioned before, unbelievably, the very same woman, again, out walking her dog in the graveyard, attached to the local St Margaret's Church in Barkin, came across another poor victim. It was already too late to help him and she was really shaken up by what had happened. She went on record as saying that she knew with both deaths that it was probably down to foul play and not a drug overdose. She also said that she felt as though the police were not treating the deaths as anything other than overdoses. Daniel Whitworth had a suicide note on his person when he was discovered and in the note he allegedly confessed to killing Stephen Port's second victim, Gabriel. This note would eventually turn out to have been written by the killer and planted on Daniel's body. I guess Stephen Port thought that he would be a suspect somehow and he needed to find a scapegoat, 
especially a so-called so -called scapegoat who could never defend himself in any way. So many mistakes were made in this case and eventually very serious questions would be asked about the lack of investigation from the police. Stephen Port's last victim was a young man called Jack Taylor who had been 25 years old at the time of his murder at the hands of Stephen Port. Jack Taylor had been living in Dagenham in London at the time. Dagenham is in East London. He worked as a forklift driver. Once again, after he met up with Stephen Port, the same scenario played out as it had with the other three young men that had been murdered. Jack Taylor was drugged, raped and his body was dumped. Stephen Port seemed to lack imagination because he dumped the body in the same graveyard as he had dumped Gabriel and Daniel just a few weeks earlier. Luckily this time the poor woman who had discovered the other two bodies did not find Jack's body. Another passerby did and called the police. Luckily, at long last, the deaths were finally linked and a suspect was identified. Stephen Port was arrested and charged with all four murders and luckily he would never be able to hurt any, another young man and wreck so many lives again. There was, in fact, so much evidence against Stephen Port once the police finally decided to carry out proper investigations and he was convicted and given a whole life tariff, which means he will never be out of, allowed out of prison, as well as the four murders that he had committed. He drugged and raped many other young men who later came forward, and some of them came forward to the police after they'd heard about the deaths of the four men by the hands of Stephen Port. The murder in this case, Stephen Port, in my opinion, had a lot of good luck when it came to fooling the authorities as many mistakes were eventually proven to have been made in relation to all four murders. There are also a, a few strange coincidences as well especially in relation to where the men's bodies were discovered. Also the fact that the same person found two bodies on two separate occasions and in almost the exact same spot. Obviously, red flags really should have been raised a lot earlier than they actually were. There have been accusations levelled at the police in this case, especially accusations of homophobia. All of the four young men that were murdered at the hands of Stephen Port were young men who thought that they were meeting up for companionship. Unfortunately, though, though, they had the misfortune to arrange dates with a man who was thought to have been obsessed with date rape drugs and had already used them on other unsuspecting young men. He would then go on to use them on the four men that he would go on to murder. Stephen Port was known to be a very vain man at the time of the murders. He was in his mid-thirties and he had already began losing his hair. He wore a hairpiece and he also used a hairpiece in his profile pictures, presumably to try and look or appear more appealing to any potential young victims. His police mugshot showed the reality and it is quite a contrast because he was not wearing his hairpiece and he did look very different. Going back to the numerous mistakes that were made by the police in this case, the first mistake was how they chose not to look into Anthony Woolgate's death but instead just put it down to a drugs overdose. The fact that the person who phoned the police gave a false name and later turned out to be a man who lived in the flats where the man had been found just outside did not seem to trouble them too much. Although Stephen Port saved a, served a few months in prison for perverting the course of justice, the police did not think to look at whether or not foul play could have been considered in the, in Anthony's death at all. Anthony Walgate's mother was on holiday abroad when she received the news that her son had been discovered dead. She must have gone through agony. She was told that Anthony had died from a drugs overdose. She did not seem to have 
any reason initially to think that someone had actually murdered her young son instead. Anthony's mother kept all of his books that contained his designs and some of the materials that he had been working on whilst he was at art school. Gabriel Kovari, the young man from Slovakia, had it turns out later actually already known Stephen Port, uh, but, but very briefly, because he had uh, rented a room from Stephen. If the police had looked into Gabriel's death rather than write it off as a drugs overdose, they would have then come across another connection with Stephen Port. A connection would have been made between Stephen Port and both of the victims, and the two later deaths would have been avoided in all probability because Stephen Port would have been locked up and awaiting trial. Had the police actually bothered to look into the deaths more thoroughly than they had, then things could have worked out very differently. Some of Stephen Port's neighbours had even met Gabriel and one of them raised concerns with the police about how the young man had really died and that he didn't believe it was a drugs overdose. The man told the police that he had met Gabriel a few times and that he had noticed that when he moved in with Stephen Port, it was shortly after that that he actually went missing and then his body was discovered in the local graveyard just a few hundred yards from Stephen Port's flat. When the man questioned Stephen about where Gabriel was, Stephen told him that Gabriel had gone off with a, another man that he had just met. Eventually, Stephen changed his story and said that Gabriel had moved back to his home country of Slovakia. He then proceeded to tell the man that Gabriel had also died from some mystery illness in Slovakia. Stephen Port also apparently stressed to the man that he should not mention any of this on social media because it would just upset Gabriel's family further. Stephen Port apparently told his neighbour that Gabriel's family had been through enough already. It is worth knowing that Gabriel's true identity was not immediately known due to the lack of ID when his body had been found, so the man did not know that Gabriel had already been found in the graveyard. The man was unidentified for a short while. During the autopsy, it was discovered that Gabriel Cavari had been given or taken a fatal dose of GBH. In court at Stephen Port's trial, it was put forward that Stephen had drugged the man and then raped him before the fatal dose killed him. It was said that probably under the cover of darkness, Stephen Port then moved Gabriel Cabari's body from his flat to the graveyard. The distance between the flat and graveyard was not very far, just a few hundred yards in fact. The lady who had found Gabriel's body testified in court that the clothes that Gabriel had been wearing looked as though someone else had put them on him because they somehow just did not look right. They'd risen up and they just didn't seem to be sitting on him very well. She also said that the police were adamant that it was not a suspicious death at all but more than likely a self-inflicted drugs overdose. A friend of Gabriel's who once the true identity of the victim had been established wanted to find out more details about the circumstances surrounding Gabriel's death. He called the police who were dealing with the the case but no information was forthcoming apparently. The friend decided to try and find out some of the details himself and s- straight away found out that another young man had previously been found dead in the same local area in very similar circumstances to how Gabriel Cavari was found. He phoned the police to discuss the cases and the similarities between Anthony Walgate and Gabriel Cavari's deaths but was told that the police were not treating the deaths as suspicious or in fact they were not linking the deaths together either. Even when another body was discovered, the young man was Daniel Whitworth. The police did not act by investigating it properly. It would also come out that 
at the trial that a suicide note had been found on Daniel's body, but that it ultimately turned out to be false. In fact, Stephen Port, the actual killer of Daniel, had written it in a way of trying to divert any attention away from himself. The police had asked um, Daniel's father to identify the handwriting, but he said that he could not be sure. He also did not have anything to compare it with. The police apparently told Daniel's family that they were going to get an expert to look at the letter, but it later transpired that they did not arrange for it to be looked at at all. The fake suicide note that Stephen Porter planted on Daniel Whitworth's body had stated that Daniel had been in a relationship with Gabriel Cavari, who was Stephen Port's second victim. The note went on to say that both Daniel and Gabriel had been taking GBH, but that Gabriel had accidentally overdosed. The note implied that Daniel had then taken his own life due to remorse that he felt due to Gabriel's overdose. However, the post-mortem that was carried out on Daniel's body had discovered some unexplained bruising under his armpits, which it was thought could indicate someone manhandling him just prior to his death. At some point during the investigation, it was also discovered that a fake MySpace page had been created by someone calling themselves John Luck. This person was trying to set up a narrative regarding both Gabriel Cavari and Daniel Whitworth. The person had implied that both men had lived a very dangerous lifestyle and that they had both often attended wild parties. The parties, parties had sometimes gone on for many days and that there had been lots of sexual partners and plenty of drugs at all of these parties and that both men attended regularly. You won't be surprised to find out that the profile was in fact set up by Stephen Port himself. Just another way of his this evil man trying to deflect any attention from himself and to somehow blacken the name of his victims. Another detail that came up in relation to Daniel Whitworth's death was the fact that when he had been discovered he had been on a bed sheet and that at his inquest the police had to admit that they had not had the bed sheet analysed for any possible traces of DNA or any fibre traces. They were also unable to carry out any tests now due to the bed sheet no longer being available for testing. A whole catalogue of errors and mistakes were clearly made in this case. Daniel's relatives had apparently not even been aware that a bedsheet had been found with his body. The inquest concluded that it was unable to reach a verdict, so it was listed as an open verdict because it could not be established if anyone else was in fact involved in Daniel's death or not. There would ultimately be enough evidence to charge Stephen Port in all four murders, including Daniel's. When the police finally started to seriously look into the murders, and with Stephen Port being the prime suspect, there was plenty of evidence to connect him to all four deaths and also to some unsolved rapes of young men as well. The police looked into Stephen's internet search history and discovered plenty of searches relating to multiple dating sites and apps. They also discovered that he had looked up information on date rape drugs as well on many occasions. Stephen Port tried to brush all of this off as just looking for porn. Luckily though the police had finally woken up to what was actually going on and what an evil man they were dealing with. The police did not even realise that murders were being carried out until it was far too late. All of the deaths had largely been attributed to drug overdoses. There was a huge uproar after all of this came out to the general public and those in the gay community were also very angry with how things had been handled, as were the relatives and the many friends of the four victims of Stephen Port, who were Anthony Gabriel. Daniel and Jack. The points that came out in the court case were that Anthony had been date raped and murdered by Stephen Port. Stephen Port had then dumped Anthony's body just 
outside the main entrance to the flats that Port lived in at the time. He then made that bizarre telephone call to the police, giving false information about what had happened. And although he served a few months in prison for perverting the course of justice in relation to Anthony's death, it had not been classed as a suspicious death or looked into in any great detail at all. It also came out that before Stephen Port went to court to face the charge linked to Anthony's death, Stephen murdered Gabriel Cavari and Daniel Whitworth. So he was obviously not scared or had any feeling that he was going to be caught at any time. Stephen Port seemed to be able to benefit from the police negligence in this case in this case it would seem this case does seem to highlight in some way just how different victim groups are often treated very differently hopefully this attitude will change but this case is fairly recent so there is still obviously a long way to go all four young men had so much of their lives to look forward to and all of them appeared to have family and f plenty of friends that cared about them a great deal. Stephen Port was just a dangerous predator who managed to get away with murder for a while, even though he was linked in some small way to at least two of his victims. It has been reported that one of the police officers who attended the scene of the first victim and Anthony Walgate raised concerns about the death but that it was not taken any further to his knowledge. The lady that discovered Gabriel and Daniel's bodies also raised concerns to the police but not much came out of it if anything at that time. It was only much later and she did testify at the trial of of Stephen Port, so at least she did have her say in the end. Also, a friend of Gabriel's had tried to convince the police that something was not right with how Gabriel had died, but he did not get very far at all. Stephen Port is a very dangerous individual who clearly does not value other men's lives at all. He even tried to blame one of the murders on another one of his victims. He also lied and said that Gabriel had gone back to Slovakia but had died in that country. Clearly that lie was not going to last long because the body of Gabriel was identified eventually. In all likelihood, in my opinion, Stephen Port would also carry on would have also carried on killing young men if he had not been caught. Fortunately, he will not be released from prison due to his whole life sentence that had been passed. Very few prisoners have ever received the whole life sentence in the UK, but he is definitely one that deserves it. Hopefully the relatives and friends of all four men who were murdered by Stephen Port will eventually have some happy memories to look back on instead of thinking about how their loved ones died at the hands of this monster. Credits for this episode go to the Sun newspaper UK, Murder Map TV on YouTube and Culture of England channel on YouTube as well as Wikipedia. Thank you very much for listening. Music